Um, good evening and welcome to this webinar this evening uh, about uh, perimenopause and uh, menopause uh, with Dr. Thierry Hertog. Hi, Thierry. Hi, Christina. <laughs> And uh, I'm very glad because uh, we have uh, so about 2,500 2, inscriptions and uh, so about 1,300 are from Italy. And so prego tutti quelli eh, che vogliono la traduzione in italiano devono cliccare sotto e, e cliccare italiano. Uh, those who want the translation uh, in Italian, please, they have to click uh, on the bottom for the translation in Italian. We have uh, uh, Enrica uh, and uh, Carmelo who are uh, translating, who are doing a simultaneous uh, translation uh, for, for all of you, for Italian people. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to to have this opportunity uh, to uh, to uh, so give you us uh, this uh, this webinar with Dr. Hertog. Uh, Dr. Hertog uh, is uh, one of the master of mine when I began uh, the study of bioidentical hormones. He's a, a doctor in uh, Brussels, uh, in and it's the, the fourth generation of endocrinologists, uh, and I have all of his books <laughs> I bought and I really recommend them to you because they are very rich in literature in, in the atlas uh, in very interesting um, uh, photos uh, and pictures uh, uh, about uh, many endocrinological uh, status uh, who are helping you in understanding uh, uh, endocrinological uh, pathologists. And uh, uh, Dr. Hertog have in Brussels um, a, um, a, a school um, which you can attend. And uh, uh, he has a very, very good uh, curses uh, who you can you can get uh, in his uh, in his uh, school and uh, uh, he wrote also two books uh, in Italian do you have this slide uh, Thierry about your books uh? I can share already the slides if you want uh, I'm doing it at the end but uh, it's maybe a good idea to do it now um, I, I think it's this and these are the two books actually you see La dieta yeah. hormonale and gli hormonale della felicità. So the first book is really how to eat better so that your hormones are better. And it's uh, also at the same editor, Sperling and, and Kupfer. And the second is the hormones of uh, happiness, which really these hormones are when you really correct well the balance with bioidentical hormones, not only female hormones, but the female hormones has a very big part of it. Um, you really get uh, to enjoy life more and to be more happy. No, I do you. So you have also an email when you want more information. But this you buy in bookstores in Italy. We don't have it in our, our website, but uh, it's. Um, I think it will open your mind. <laughs> Of course, because uh, nutrition is uh, is very important, and uh, people who follow me uh, know it uh, very very well. Okay, and uh, uh, I uh, write it also a book who has been pub which has been published uh, uh, right now in June and in about about hormones in Italian, uh, of course. Okay, I I will so just let me show the book of your. Um, this is the one. So that's your book. Yes, it's non è solo una questione di hormoni. It's not. Uh, it's not only a matter of of hormones, and uh, uh, it's also about uh, bioidentical hormones, uh, but not only, because we uh, we are going surely to discuss uh, today with Dr. Hertog uh, how lifestyle is important uh, for a good life for us women, not only with forty, but with fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty always okay thank you Terry. uh okay i would suggest that uh, we begin 
with uh, with our webinar and uh, um, i would begin with uh, um, with a question about hrt of uh, about uh, um, bioidentical hrt and uh, uh, the role of the different hormones uh, uh, for the woman for the woman with in perimenopause, which can start at uh, 35, uh, and uh, uh, which role can play bioidentical hormones and hormones, uh, of course, uh, for the well-being uh, of the of the woman, which import which importance. Yeah, um, if I can um, intervene, is that um, uh, many years ago, um, the usually only menopause was treated. But female hormone deficiencies start much earlier. Studies have shown that from age 30 on, women start de being depleted in female hormones. And, and not only female, but also male hormones, because male hormones are also important for women. There's a sort of balance. And um, so I usually start to treat uh, um, women with female hormones from age 30, 35, on latest 40. You don't need to wait to the menopause. Menopause is sort of... Um, very strong drop, and that's uh, too bad. But you can see that women start aging at age 30, and there are little signs of estrogen deficiency. The eyes begin to be more dry. The hair flattens because female hormones give a lot of volume to the hair, and uh, also vaginal dryness. And there's a little wrinkles on the upper lip that start to appear that are uh, mainly due to lack of female hormones, especially estrogens. And so it's very important to treat acne with female hormones. We, we, I, I do this since many, many years. And one of the reasons I'm so motivated to treat is that I, I tried myself female hormones. I tried myself by identical estrogen and progesterone for three days, not more, because it was not in fashion to take a lot of female hormones for men at that time, at least. But um, I was so much better. I had more energy, excitement. I had strength. Uh, and then I stopped on a Saturday. Of course, it was after a hard week. And I was, I was depressed. And then I said to myself, wow, what a difference with female hormones. So I said, never in my life will I miss a female hormone deficiency anymore because it makes you so much difference in your life. And so I, I think now that many women are being treated long before the menopause with female hormones and that they feel much better with this. Um, so I, that this is really important to know that it's not when it's a catastrophe, when it's a fantastic piece, you have to start treating. But you can start treating before in women who have a menstrual cycle, even a normal menstrual cycle. But there will be always certain abnormalities after age 30 that say there's a need for female hormones. But which which hormone do you think uh, that is uh, uh, the first to drop uh, and to give uh, so symptoms about a uh, 30, 35, uh, 40? Well, let's say that the first hormone to drop is the hormone that is made thanks to the ovulation is progesterone. So I have women being treated from the 18th to 26th day of the cycle to prevent a lack of progesterone. The lack of progesterone is seen by, by bloating, uh, painful breasts that are swollen too much by a nervousness in a woman called premenstrual syndrome with irritability, anxiety, and things like that. And there's also an, a, a swollen lower belly that, and the menstruation start to be more abundant. Those are typical signs of progesterone deficiency. And they should be treated all sleep less well when they have a, a lack of uh, progesterone. And then let's say that that starts in most women around age 30, around age 33, 35, slowly estradiol starts to, to decrease, which is the main estrogen. And there's a need for estradiol so that there's a better mucosa, the eyes, the mouth is less dry. It's not dry actually with it, and, and also vagina. And, and typically also women can see that on the breast. If they don't have enough female hormones, the breast start being droopy. It start to be, have a dosis. And uh, that can be corrected. You don't need to have female hormone surgery with uh, increase in size of the breast or a rectification. If you give on time female hormones, the breast can stay much longer uh, at a good tone, uh, at young, youthful tone. So, um, and then there is also actually um, a decrease in testosterone. To give you an idea, at age 40, a woman has the level of testosterone, 50% uh, lower level than a woman of 21 years. 
So this means that this is a, a very severe drop. You don't have such a severe drop in men with testosterone. It goes much slower. Um, men also have much more testosterone, so they are much richer. But this drop in testosterone by 50% uh, also explains why women start losing libido. They don't have um, desire to have sexual intercourse. So, uh, and it's just because of lack of testosterone. And you would say, oh, it's just a male hormone who cares about, but that means that women start to have cellulite because of the lack of testosterone. They start to be really um, um, more tired uh, when they do physical exercise, for example. And inside of the body of a woman who has low testosterone, the arteries start to have atherosclerosis. There are several studies showing that the lower the testosterone levels are, the more there's atherosclerosis in a woman. So it's really important to think that women need these three hormones to be much better. And, and that really makes a difference. Do you think that the administration of testosterone is better um, in this case, for example, for vaginal dryness or for libido, loss of libido? Uh, it's better trans, uh, the vaginal way or transdermal? I prefer a transdermal way. And then when women have uh, a lot of cellulite or are collapsed, the women who are mentally collapsed, like depressed and nothing helps, then I give testosterone injections that are slightly higher amounts. And, and that works terrific. You have women who are like uh, really depressed since 20 years, and then suddenly they can become the new prime minister of the country. I've seen really some amazing results with testosterone injections. So we you always need to give testosterone with female hormones in order to yeah. preserve the balance. Of course, but in which dose and which testosterone do you give it as an injection? Well, you can give a sort of physiological dose, but that's about 30 milligrams of testosterone inentate per month. Okay. Um, it would be better um, in some women to give high amounts, and then you need to give a blocker uh, of the conversion of testosterone to the hormone that gives virilization, masculization, and that is called dehydrotestosterone. They give with finasteride. So the higher you are, the more you include this blocker uh, of converse. But the women are uh, so happy with it, and, and especially business women do very well with it. Of course, um, when you give uh, testosterone, so in higher dosage, you give always uh, a, a little dose of finasteride? Yes, usually it depends. Of course, I check in blood, a lab test called androstandiol ducronide. And the cell yep. is the major metabolite of dehydrotestosterone. It's in 10 times higher amounts in women than uh, testosterone, for example. And this one may not be above the average level in the reference value. If it is, then there's a risk of getting masculinization in the woman and uh, scalp hair loss. So you uh, I need to be very careful. And so I also ask this test before and during a treatment to be sure we're controlling well, and, and then it works out well. I, I, the results are also good. Also, I would um, really recommend never to give finasteride, which is synthetic progesterone, to women or to men without testosterone. Otherwise, there are some risk of getting um, sexual regression, genital areas regressing and, and, and vulvar sclerosis. So you, you always have to have enough, but not too much, of this androstandial glucanide, which is the marker of dehydrotestosterone. And uh, what about vaginal dryness? Uh, do you prefer estriol or DHA or testosterone? Well, the best for vaginal dryness is estradiol. Just giving a systemic treatment, a treatment transdermal estradiol is generally sufficient. If it's not enough, in women who have had since a long time estrogen deficiency, they have a sort of atrophy, you need to give locally. And there I give estriol. I think that's the best. Uh, it is uh, the estrogen of the mucosa. Also in women who have bladder infection often, you give uh, vaginal uh, estriol, you get eight times less bladder infections. So it shows you how it not only improves the vagina mucosa, but also it improves the bladder uh, mucosa. And, and that's very good. The testosterone can help, but it's not the major hormone. The major hormones for the dryness is estrogen. DHA has been shown to put in ovules, and even oxytocin has been shown in ovules, these hormones. And they, um, but, but 
they don't have, the, you have to give overdoses to get the effect you get with normal doses of estriol or estradiol. And uh, um, we, we women, we have also a deficit uh, in uh, DHEA. Yeah. And uh, do, do you think uh, it's so important uh, as testosterone is to give a substitution in uh, DHEA? I always give to women DHEA and testosterone next to the female hormones. So it's like 50-50. However, women have more improvement with testosterone. Uh, mental improvement, they become determined, sure of themselves, they can take decisions. The body firms itself better than with DHEA. But DHEA is still a hormone that is good for the immune system more than, than testosterone. So there are advantages to give the two. And that's how it is in women. So I would suggest giving the two hormones. But if a woman complains about, uh, so tired, she's just very tired, without energy, and so you would give testosterone. This is more for energy, for physical activity, like doing yes. sports, for example. There are many other hormones that help energy. For example, thyroid hormones give you uh, a lot of energy because they stimulate all the hormones in the body. And thyroid gives especially more energy in the morning. Uh, and, and when you are um, sitting or you're laying down, you feel more energetic with thyroid hormones you, uh, than uh, otherwise. However, for example, you have hormones like testosterone. It's more in sports activity that you find the difference. And estrogens give a constant energy the whole day. So if you want to uplift the energy the whole day in a woman, it might be that she's deficient in estrogen and estrogen will help on that way. But um, when you begin an HRT for a woman, do you begin uh, only with uh, progesterone and estradiol or with also with testosterone and DHEA? Yes, I tend to give the whole panel because it's safer. Otherwise, you create an imbalance. You have more female hormones if you would start only with female hormones. And, and that would um, block partly the effects of testosterone and DHEA. So you need to have... In, in my experience, at least, uh, to give all the hormones, it works better. And then often you can give smaller doses and it works better than trying to give much more of, one, of two hormones and not the others. Um, I, I think it's, it's a valuable treatment, but it's better to give all the hormones a person is deficient in. And uh, about, uh, uh, so estrogen, estradiol, uh, do you prefer transdermal uh, application or uh, oral? Estradiol works better. It, it's the more physiological when you give on, uh, usually you have to rub on a long distance, yes. not a short distance. You have to put the full arm in, in the arm. You put, for example, one gram and then a second gram of the product on the arm and the shoulder and you wipe 10 times more. When you do that, the estradiol accumulates in the fat tissue under the skin. And um, that means that it will be slowly a 24 hour release and you have enough for 24 hours in most women with that sort of treatment. If you would give it oral, orally it will accumulate in the liver. Even if it's a natural uh, bidental estradiol, if you give it orally, accumulate the liver and the liver makes something special. It stimulates the production of a lot of proteins that are going to capture and transport in blood, but capture also a lot of other hormones. So you have a deficiency in thyroid, defic thyroid hormones with it. You have a lack of cortisol. You have a lack of growth hormone. There are a lot of important hormones that don't work so well in women who are taking oral estrogen. So I, if, I, I give oral estrogen to one with Alzheimer, for example, because it's so easy for them. But otherwise, if they can, it's preferable to give a transdermal estradiol with oral or vaginal progesterone. I've seen a work uh, from um, Jonathan Wright. He uh, compared the giving of uh, um, estrogen, oral given estrogen, uh, a half a gram, a milligram, a one milligram. He compared it with transdermal and uh, the oral uh, dosage absorption from uh, estradiol gives more proliferative metabolites. Yes, um, uh, Jonathan Wright has a laboratory in Seattle, Washington, that measures all the metabolites, much more than I can have in my lab. 
And uh, he, I think he showed that um, the safe metabolites like metoxiestrones are increased with transdermal and, and they are uh, decreased with oral. And also you have a, a ratio between the positive, let's say, two hydroxyestrone and the breast cancer promoting 16 hydroxyestrone. Uh, also this balance is disturbed. So it's always better to give the transdermal estradiol. It's not always true for other treatments, but for estradiol, estrogen, it is really true. Transdermal works better. You control always uh, by your patients uh, uh, the blood levels of the hormones? I always check the hormone levels, but I always do something more, is that I always check the transporting protein, the plasma binding globulin is called, okay. is a trans, is protein that transports to the tissues the hormone in blood. And because if it's too high, it keeps the hormone in blood and it doesn't go in the organ so well. So you need to have a good uh, ratio between the estradiol in the blood, for example, and the SHBG sex hormone binding globulin that transport. If it's too high, the sex hormone binding globulin will be less estrogens going in the target cells. And uh, if it's too high, the uh, SHBG, what do you do? What do you suggest to the woman to have uh, so, uh, a less? Uh, this less first cause that the blood test has not been done in good conditions. And typically, is when the SHBG is high, is a person who doesn't drink any water before and is dehydrated. I always advise my patients before they do a blood test in the morning to drink something like a third to a half a liter of water before, because otherwise the blood is concentrated and you don't have the average or the normal picture. And, and because when there's not enough water in the, the blood vessels, the binding proteins are very big, stay in the blood, but the water is out, it gives a higher concentration that is, let's say, artificial. Um, but the main reasons otherwise, if it's not that, if the SHBG is high, is it's either an excess of estrogens or thyroid hormones, they stimulate the production of SHBG, or it's a deficiency, and that is often the case of testosterone, which is the main hormone to decrease SHBG. There are other hormones that decrease it, insulin, cortisol, and, and others, but the main one is testosterone. It could indicate a deficiency in testosterone. And you see this a lot with women who take a birth control pill. Huh? The SHBG that should be, let's say, 65 nanomoles per liter is 330 nanomoles per liter with it because of the accumulation of estrogens in the liver. It's, it's liver. a fantastic... Yeah. Uh, and other binding proteins are also double or triple. So it really is not so good to give, to give oral estrogens. And when a woman takes a birth control pill, we, we try to choose a better birth control pill that has less worries. And we add often hormones that are deficient due to the pill intake. And uh, um, you add to an um, oral contraceptive, uh, so mostly testosterone because uh, they can have so a loss of libido. Yes, but then the doses are relatively still small, but it, it often happens that the birth control pills are so low dosed now that you need even to add estradiol and progesterone and testosterone and DHA uh, because of that. Um, and uh, But it works out well and it does not suppress the the um, the inhibiting effect, the contraceptive effect of birth control, it doesn't interfere. Okay, no, no, that, it, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, point of view, and uh, uh, you add uh, such hormones uh, when the if the if the woman complains about. Well, she has symptoms or complaints of estrogen deficiency. She complains of vaginal dryness. When I see it, a physical exam, her eyes are dry, her face is pale, the hair is flat, yeah. and she's tired all the time. She's estrogen deficient, and that is generally 95% uh, times confirmed in the blood test. And uh, uh, about estradiol, which uh, uh, which level do you do you like uh, um, with your therapy that a woman has um, to be protective of, uh, so, so against uh, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, uh, and also cognitive uh, uh, features? Well, there are let's say two levels. There's the level for a woman before the menopause, when she's still young, and has the menstrual cycle. There we check the 21st day of a 28-day cycle, seven days before menstruation, where there's a peak level of estrogen, 
And that peak level should be in picograms per ml, 165 picograms per ml. The, the normal level is, uh, the reference is between 100 and 250, let's say and you're just in the middle. And that's actually the good level for an European woman or Caucasian woman. However, in Asia, um, people, uh, women are smaller and, and, and uh, so, and they have less breast development, the lower levels are better, like 120 picograms per ml in a young woman. In the menopause, you need at least to have 70 to 80 picograms per ml to avoid cardiovascular diseases. Otherwise, there are studies showing more cardiovascular disease. So the menopause levels are lower, but also it's constantly given, except maybe five days per month. So actually, they still have a lot of estrogens by maintaining levels of 80 to 90 picograms per ml. And they don't need to have this peak level uh, that you have in, in young women who still have a menstrual cycle. And uh, what about proge progesterone? You give it uh, orally? So um, most women prefer taking progesterone orally and it works relatively good. There are some circumstances where it doesn't work so well, but the absorption vaginally is about 25% better of the progesterone. So I tend to propose vaginally, uh, but if it doesn't have enough efficacy with oral, but there's an advantage with oral uh, progesterone is that when you take it orally, it is before you take it before bedtime, it's converted in the liver, it's absorbed and converted in the liver into sleep inducing metabolites. So you sleep better with oral uh, progesterone than uh, vaginally, uh, uh, vaginal progesterone. And how is your position about uh, progesterone in transdermal application? Transdermal works much less. So you need to put it on a high absorption place. So if you give a transdermal, it has to be a 10% uh, um, progesterone uh, liposomal cream would be better because they have, and then I asked the woman to put it on the upper chest. They also can put it here and there uh, where they blush because there's more blood vessels. So there's better absorption on these places. And so if you use it, you need to put it but in my experience, women don't do uh, on the average so well. They seem to do better with the oral or the vaginal forms. And uh, um, what about the side effects uh, or eventually uh, so, so seeing side effects uh, from the HEA or testosterone, so if they have a little bit acne uh, on the face uh, or they have so... Um, little uh, bit of uh, hirsutism on the, on the legs, uh, also in the menopause. So what can, can women do? So DHEA, some women do not tolerate so well DHEA. Even the, and that's usually due to estrogen deficiency. So if you increase the estrogens, you probably correct the situation. But there are still some women where you cannot give more than five milligrams or eight milligrams of DHEA per day, or they have acne or they have scalp hair loss. And uh, so it's, it's, it's very important to uh, personalize the treatment and check what there is. If there's acne, usually the dose has to be decreased. If there's body hair growth, uh, I often say stop for two months, then take half dose again after two months so that we quickly arrange the situation. Um, because it takes time. And also when you have a hair, you have to know that if you don't take a hair away, it can stay four years on the chin or on the cheek. So it's, it's very important uh, as soon as that happens uh, to correct the situation and, and explain that the, the hair has to be plucked out. It won't come back again if the, uh, the, um, the levels are, are okay. Now, in these women, I also um, propose for if they have acne on the face or hair on the girl to, to when they put estradiol, because I don't only give DHA to women who have had or received estradiol, to put the remaining on the face. And that is very protective against acne and against body hair. Ah. And hair. Yeah. Est Some estradiol. 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 I see. Very efficient, yes. Uh, wonderful. No, no, it's it's really. It's I didn't I didn't know it. Uh, um, and uh, but in your experience, are the side effects uh, of and um, more often uh, to see to have been seen with DHA or testosterone? So about acne or or so, so hair loss or uh, body hairs. 
I think it's with both, it, it can happen. Um, however, I, I don't have much problems with my patients because I take this laboratory test, the metabolite of the hydrotestosterone, androstandel gluconide. And, and I, I check it before and, and during treatment. So quickly when it gets higher, it gets higher before it gets hair growth. So, right. so we can decrease it uh, with finasteride or with lowering the dose of DHA of testosterone uh, quite well. And so I, I relatively rarely, I can have, but relatively rarely have any of those side effects in my patients because of this good control of laboratory tests that gives us the knowledge if there's a risk or not of hair growth. In, in your experience, which dose of DHEA uh, could be adequate uh, so for a woman? Well, here in, in let's say in Italy or in Europe, it would be 20 milligrams is the average level. It can climb up to 30 milligrams, uh, but I wouldn't give higher. Um, and I would always give it with female hormones in order to be sure to keep a woman feminine and, and not masculinize her. I see. And uh, if a woman has uh, a deficit uh, in testosterone and uh, DHEA in the perimenopause, uh, you give the, the woman uh, DHEA and testosterone? Yes, as soon as there is a deficiency. Uh, so um, on average, let's say I, I start giving it around age 30 to 35. But look at women who have had a pregnancy. Yeah. They have 26 years. And suddenly, after the pregnancy, it looked like a mother, not like the young woman before. They looked a little older. And so um, I had this with my wife, and I gave her female hormones. And then she looked back as beautiful as she was before and as healthy as she was before. So generally, when a woman has had pregnancy, there's a little decline of the sex hormones. And it's worth giving a small treatment at that moment. And you will see that the woman get more energy. Uh, and, 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 and so on. So I even have a special treatment that I give when women are breastfeeding with female hormones that does not give any bad effects to the children, but makes that she has much more energy, I agree. Okay. And then uh, there is a, um, a question uh, that women have about breast, how to keep it fine, yes. beautiful. Yes, so there are two questions, how to keep it youthful and how to keep it beautiful, uh, uh, healthy also yes. from cancer. Yes. So the first thing, how to keep the breast beautiful, um, there is in, on a hormone level is that the, you should always provide enough estradiol with progesterone uh, in adequate balance. Even if a woman has hysterectomy or removal of uterus for any, whatever the cause like fibroids, she still needs to have progesterone. So always estrogen and progesterone. And that gives that she won't have breast tenders, but she will st still have tonic breast and the breasts are healthier. Um, um, so the first thing is to correct all this balance. I had a, a woman of 85 years who had beautiful breasts and she didn't take so much treatments. Uh, she did when she came to me, but, but before not. And she said, I put my breast under a cold shower every day. And that's how I explain they are so beautiful, uh, even at my age. Uh, and she, of course, she had a lover of 40 years old, it is apparently a very beautiful diplomat, American diplomat or something. So um, um, she had to keep her breast well. And uh, <laughs> it shows that the hormones work well. Now, how to keep the breast safe? First, don't take coffee. Caffeine is related, at least in animal studies, with more breast cancer, tumors, etc. It increased the proliferation. It also disembalances. There's more estrogens, less um, progesterone. So I would stop caffeine. Stop any food that provide cancer. Uh, for example, um, uh, if you eat uh, grilled meat, the black stripes, they are full of carcinogens. If you cook in oil, and I'm sorry for your olive oil, that is probably the best in the world, but you, if you cook it, it becomes elatic acid and it can promote cancer. So uh, I, I personally never cook my, uh, almost never, I cook my uh, uh, meals in, in, in oil because it's always a little toxic. Even coconut oil, there's two to 4% unsaturated fatty acids that change structure and that makes it also. 
So you need to have a fine cooking that is steamed, boiling, etc., and to um, also um, um, drink a lot of water. Um, water takes the carcinogens you would have from the food and wipe it away. So people who are dehydrated are more at risk. Also, sweets and sugars are related to more proliferation of breast cancer cells. So I would be very uh, careful. Now, which are the hormones that can protect? There's melatonin can protect. There are also nutrients that can protect, like selenium and find me. So I think it's really worth to go to for a patient to go to a physician who knows about it and treats. And, and I, th I think you have some oncologists that are very knowledgeable in Italy. Yeah? I have a friend called Pasaglia who is oriented on nutrients and, and hormones to reduce the breast cancer risk. So I think uh, you are uh, fortunate uh, somewhere there in Italy. But you, 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 you have spoken about melatonin, and uh, uh, do you mean uh, supplementa supplementation in melatonin or yes. natural production of melatonin uh, at night, during the night uh, hours? Well, there are two ways. Is that um, in older people, they have very low melatonin levels, but when they submit older people to much more light, contrast, light, daytime light and nighttime darkness, it, they get up to 70% the levels of melatonin young people have. So I think uh, the, the older people live in a dark environment. It's not good. You should go outside. There's a lot of light outside and your house should be full of light and that can be protective with a lot of darkness at night, then you make much more melatonin. However, um, when you have a disease, um, it is, uh, melatonin is very special. It's, if you take a high amount when you're very healthy, you don't tolerate it. You, you sleep three, four hours well, and then you wake up in a sort of um, uh, sweating and hypertonic uh, situation. So high doses when you're healthy are not so well, good. But however, when you have a disease, you can give enormous amount of melatonin. They don't hurt you. And they seem really to help you, to cure you. Even in the COVID, there were two studies showing uh, no mortality in people who took melatonin when they were very severely sick, while there was 30% mortality in the other people who had the same severity of illness. So basically, um, melatonin is really, uh, I'm very, um, have appreciate melatonin because it gives, uh, if you have stroke, it can decrease by 90% the stroke lesions. So, so uh, melatonin is really something that is, um, I think, very healthy and can be used in disease too. And uh, uh, which dose of melatonin uh, do you um, suggest for your patients? Well, the normal dose is very low because um, it's the physiological dose, those that we normally make. And that is sublingual. That means that you put it under the tongue and you let it melt. Uh, and the dose is between 0 0.05 milligrams and 0 0.2 milligrams. And you, um, all other doses are overdoses. Uh, if you give orally, it, you still will be physiological dose. You take 0 0.5 milligrams, a half a milligram. But if you go higher, you're generally supraphysiological. Now, when a person has a disease, for example, uh, stroke or symptom, I give uh, up to um, um, two times 20 milligrams to two times 40 milligrams a day. And, and that gives fantastic results. And it's well tolerated. You can even give uh, 10 times more like Two times 400 milligrams, you cannot kill a person with it. It's, it's still safe, uh, but it probably won't do more effects if you give too much than if you give the, the right dose. And I think the right dose is two, two times 20 milligrams, two times 40 milligrams when you have COVID or you have uh, cancer or you have something like that. Uh, okay. For, for short while. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, one question is uh, about uh, bioidentical HRT. How long can a woman uh, so make it, take it? Well, um, how long does she want to live? When she decides, I don't want to live anymore, then she stops the treatment. Otherwise, you continue till the end and you'll probably live much longer because <laughs> I have all the studies and uh, they are very hopeful. You know, I, I ask it because uh, I have many patients 
um, theory that uh, um, the poor one, uh, that the gynecologists, uh, they are going after five years to stop uh, HRT and they are desperate. And uh, um, despite uh, the, the guidelines also in Italy, uh, so they are the, the same guidelines as the International Menopause Society uh, says, the same as, uh, as you told us. Yep. Uh, the guidelines are not for experts. Guidelines are, I'm sorry to say so, but for dummies, for people don't know much about it for doctors in order for them not to make big risks big, yeah. big errors yeah. you have guidelines but they're not for intelligent people who have experience and competency they're for persons who don't know much about and and it's that's the the richness and the of the, and the good of the the guidelines but once you're an expert uh, don't look at guidelines otherwise you cannot personalize the treatment and every treatment has to be tailor made has to be personalized to a patient doses are in every person different so if you want to personalize you need to be expert yourself and take, go out of the guidelines i agree fully with you and uh, now, so a uh, controversial chapter, it's uh, HRT and cancer. Uh, there are really many, many women who had uh, breast cancer and uh, uh, they don't uh, get uh, uh, HRT. Uh, what's your position? Well, there are not so many studies, but um, in the time I, I searched the studies uh, uh, on women receiving um, female hormones after breast cancer, so they get a removal of the tumor and then they get the, the, the female hormones or testosterone. And it showed, um, the, half of the studies showed that there was a decrease in recurrence of new breast cancer if they received the female hormones. And there, there was a decrease in mortality by tw minus 20 to minus 80%. So you have much less risk of dying if you take the female hormones. There was only one study on the 14th that showed a bad effect and was stopped, but that um, um, that uh, study was done on uh, with uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate as a progesterone, which is known to cause atherosclerosis. It's a very bad synthetic progesterone, and it causes breast cancer uh, proliferation. Uh, to give you an idea, if you give bidental hormones in uh, on cells th that uh, of the, the breast, and you give estradiol. It increased the proliferation of those breast cells. If you give progesterone, it drops the proliferation, the natural progesterone. If you give conjugated estrogens, uh, which is what is often given orally, those are um, horse uh, estrogens, you increase more the proliferation of cells, uh, breast cells than estradiol. But however, when you give medroxyprogesterone acetate, that bad progesterone, you increase even much more. The proliferation. You don't decrease it like natural, you increase it. So basically, uh, you need to choose the right uh, bidental estrogens. It's absolutely not true that there are not many studies. You know that most of the studies on female hormones, the double blind placebo control studies, the only studies you should actually focus on, uh, the vast majority is made it on bidental hormones and compound it, especially for the study, like a compounded in, in, in. so there's a, a lot of fuss, but because um, those who make the fuss and oppose don't read the literature. It's, I don't know what happens. It's like they're, um, they don't want to look, I think. Uh, they want to have an opinion. They don't want to have the truth. Well, I prefer having the truth and reading all the literature, the positive, negative, and then I can Get, have I know what, what happens. And um, one question about uh, the form of the bioidentical hormones. Uh, you, um, you check, you control the pharmacy who produces uh, the, compa the comp compound pharmacies who produces the hormones for you? Yes, so um, I've tried a lot of pharmacies and, and of the hormones on, on patients, so I, I know some more about. It's not always the same. It, the, I think the molecular structure is more of the same, but the way they prepare it can be different. So for example, for the female hormones, I do prefer pharmaceutical uh, brands uh, like uh, Estrogel, Estrodose, or 
you know, in and, and for estrogens and transdermal, and then the micronized progesterone, which is also commercialized, but they are generic forms that are very good. So it's, if it's, but basically. Basically, you find, Doctor, you find that uh, uh, for for women, for uh, hormones, it's better the, the hormones we get in the pharmacy? I think generally it is better um, because what you don't get in pharmacy, you get actually um, is phytoestrogens, but it's not the real hormones. Yes. So I think the only way is to get them in the pharmacy. You have a control from the pharmacy. They have a responsibility. They may not deliver anything. So you have a better guarantee. Okay. Okay. No, I agree with you fully because I've seen uh, in Italy so growing uh, so pharmacies we are producing the hormones uh, and I think it's not so easy to compound uh, a hormone with a good quality uh, yeah. contents. Uh, but for testosterone, for example, uh, usually the transdermal compounded uh, are better than what is on the market by uh, uh, pharmaceutical firms. Also, because the doses are too low for the pharmaceutical firms, that's one or two percent. That's insufficient for men. For women, it could be sufficient, but not. So it's 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 it depends on what type of hormone yeah. gives the real answer. In the in the transdermal form of uh, testosterone for the woman, you think uh, 10, 15 milligram is a good. Uh, well, that's it? normally a high dose for women. So generally it's like three to five milligrams transdermal per day. Uh, and if you give higher amounts, like the ones I, I do give with the injections, you need them for last right. So uh, if you um, don't want to risk having masculinization, it might be better to stick to five milligrams, three yeah. milligrams, seven milligrams per day transdermal. I, I use always about five, three to five, but I yeah. learned from you. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Paya loss of libido. We, we spoke about it before, but I wanted to ask it um, another time. You give it testosterone transdermal, not vaginal. Uh, vaginally, never. Uh, it's not necessary bad treatment to give it vaginally. It's just that I didn't make the experience because it works enough transdermal or I was yeah. at injection. Uh, but it, it, it is important to remember that in my experience, at least, uh, the testosterone is by far the strongest hormone to stimulate libido in women. And estradiol is second, but it's, it's far behind. So, and, and also studies have shown that testosterone doesn't work to improve the libido if there's not enough estradiol. So it's an interaction between the two. That's very important, I think, to note. A woman has to have enough estradiol for testosterone to improve the libido. And uh, uh, if they put so transdermal testosterone and uh, transdermal uh, estradiol, um, is it better that they put it? Is it better that they put it uh, in uh, different so uh, places? Well, not necessary because uh, one can improve the absorption of the other. So what I propose is um, because transdermal testosterone is less to give. So you put it on the inner arm yeah. and say for estradiol, you put it all over also on the inner arm. So there's no excess body hair here that will grow. So it's like a protection. So I think you can add both uh, together. Studies have shown, for example, that the absorption of testosterone in men uh, was improved when you put other creams, even sunscreen makes the absorption ah. better. Yeah, so, but I think it depends on which sunscreen. So I there see. are better ones and, and some may be too sticky and may block the absorption. So I would always, uh, if you um, go in the sun, you want to put a sunscreen, first put estradiol and testosterone and two hours later, uh, go and put the sunscreen after. I see. And there, uh, What's your opinion about Tibolone? So Tibolone is actually um, a sort of compound that has three actions, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So for, it is, for women who take it, it is actually good if they don't take anything else. It's the only thing they take it. Some women want to make it easy. However, I think 
if you want to optimize and personalize the treatment, it's better to give the three hormones differently because you can 100% personalize to the needs of a, a person. So I think it's a sort of um, compromise treatment that is acceptable. There are studies that show that it might a little bit increase the breast cancer risk compared to transdermal estradiol and progesterone, but um, there are not many studies um, showing that. So you cannot really say it with for certainty it is so, but I, I think for a woman to feel fantastic because that's what we physicians want to make our patients that they feel really good. The, the best treatment is the personalized treatment with the three hormones. Sometimes I got the idea that uh, some women get uh, Tibolone because uh, it's, it's, uh, so it's easier for the prescribing doctor to give Tibolone than to formulate a personalized uh, therapy. Yeah, they, they don't have to think too much about balancing the hormones. Yeah. Yeah. So it's shorter consultations. However, it has been shown that it might be a very good treatment for women who have very big fibroids. And then they do a special treatment where they block the ovaries yeah. and give Tibolon. And it seems to be maybe the optimal treatment to make this six months trial that they often have to submit uh, tolerable. So it helps them to, to survive this treatment that can drastically reduce the fibroids. Yeah. And then it's a, it's a very nice question which uh, comes every, every time. HRT, if a woman doesn't have any symptoms, any menopausal symptoms, what is your statement about Well, first, I have never seen a woman without menopausal symptoms or physical signs. If you age, you're probably deficient in sex hormones. So it's the thing is that, you know, we have to live what I think in life essential. And the essential is that we blossom our personality, when we really our soul or whatever, and we blossom our patience. And so um, one of the big problems, spiritual problems that people have is they block their emotions. And they block their, because they, they take so much time to block the emotions. So they say, I, look, I'm a, I'm a good person. I'm never angry. I'm, I never am weak. I, I, I never cry and I never have um, fear. Um, and and then those people don't feel anything because they have made their body unsensitive. But as a doctor, you see all the signs of physical hormone deficiency. And so these persons are very courteous persons, but it's a little suicidal because you, you need to take good care of yourself. That means you need to make that your body looks good. It feels good. If body looks good, you're healthier. And, and so I, I think... Um, um, part of the action of the doctor is to make the patient aware to be good for her or himself. We don't always have to work for others for a project. We have to be good for ourselves. And that means we have to observe what happens in our and, and try to correct what uh, marries the correction. And that is female hormones in, in women and with testosterone at the menopause or long before the menopause. That's part of the program of good care of yourself. Healthy self-love. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, very, very well done <laughs> when I say it. And uh, uh, smoking and HRT. Smoking and HRT, um, the problem of smoking is that it decreases your arteries. And, and so the blood flow is not so good. Uh, you see a lot of those people who smoke a lot, they have uh, more wrinkles and they, they prematurely age, but they also have a paler face. So there's less blood supply all over the body, not only on the skin. And so I don't think it's so good. Um, I, it's probably worse with oral estrogens to smoke because there's more coagulation factors uh, because of the oral estrogens. And then with the risk of having more thrombos of the smoking, it uh, increases the risk. So I think if you smoke, try to smoke outdoors, to drink a lot of water, try to decrease the smoking and take transdermal estradiol as a woman with progesterone. And I would take vaginal progesterone in that case. We spoke before about vaginal dryness and a uh, uh, question is, so laser for vaginal dryness. I have no uh, competence or knowledge about the laser, but why would you give laser therapy for vaginal dryness 
that maybe have a stimulating effect on the glands if you can restore the mucosa by vaginal estriol or systemic uh, general uh, uh, on the arms uh, estradiol. So I, I think it's better than nothing. You uh, we as doctors need to help our patients, um, but it would be better to treat the cause than the consequence. Of course, and uh, sleep disturbance and menopause. So in the sleep, there can be several reasons why a woman doesn't sleep well in the menopause. Uh, one of the reasons is estradiol deficiency, and that gives hot flushes. So she wakes up with a hot flush and then falls back asleep and get a hot flush, wakes up and thinks. So that is treated by estradiol. But then the nervousness, uh, the, the tenseness, that is calmed down by progesterone. So you can have the two problems together also. And uh, so the best is to give estradiol. Sometimes if there's still some hot flushes at night, you give a little dose at night with at nighttime progesterone, preferably oral when there's sleep disorders. And that helps a lot with the sleep disorders. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, the most uh, question that uh, I uh, I had from my followers. And I've seen here we have uh, uh, for the next half an hour, many so Q&A. If you agree, I would, uh, I would, uh, uh, Okay, the Cecilia wanted a translation on Espanol, but <laughs> we don't have it. And uh, um, okay. So there's a reference for uh, a person of uh, Manchester. I, I don't know personally in Manchester okay. or doctor, but um, uh, there's um, in um, the England, it's a little bit more difficult to get bioidentical hormones. Um, really? There's a, a medical board that is a little bit, but you wow. have London actually um, uh, people that are um, um, able. There's a, in, I think, Haley Street or something, there's a center where they can treat bioidentical hormones in London. Um, are you reading or are we all to date with the reading? Uh, yeah, no, I, I wanted only to see Louis, uh, Louis Newson in England. Louise Newson, she's I a GP oh. and menopause specialist. Uh, Louis Newson, but uh, UK, but I don't know where she has where she has the office. But it's in London. Somewhere. I don't know if, it's, if she's in London or it's, it's London. Ah. Okay, really? uh, question in French that I will translate in English. What do you do when you have endometriosis or adenomyosis, uh, fibroids, uh, when you receive estrogens? Uh, my levels are very low in estrogens, but I have a tendency to get estrogen predominant, uh, so I don't take progesterone. Um, so um, when you have uh, endometriosis or fibroids, uh, I provide uh, estradiol at lower doses. For example, in a woman who is in the, still with a menstrual cycle from the fifth to 20th day of the cycle with, for example, one and a half milligram of transdermal estradiol. But I will start either the fifth or the 10th day of the cycle with progesterone. And uh, I might give us a, a, a non-bidental progesterone, but that is extremely close to the bidental progesterone, which is called didrogesterone, which you have in France, it's called dufaston. And I give them a half a tablet to one tablet from the fifth or the 10th day of the cycle to the 14th, and then one and a half tablet of 10 milligrams uh, from, or two or two tablets of uh, 10 milligrams from the 15th, 25th day of the cycle. And then you suppress the estrogen predominance, and you still correct the estrogen deficiency that there is, and, and it, go, it, it goes out very well. Now, in endometriosis, they often don't ovulate well because of thyroid deficiency. So I may correct the thyroid, and they may have an adrenal deficiency, so they inflame more, so I may correct the cortisol deficiency with DHA deficiency. So it's a complex treatment, but the treatment is to take um, progesterone that stays longer in blood than the bidentical progesterone. The by identical micronized progesterone stays about 16 hours on 24 hours in blood, while the other one stays 24 hours. And that's better for a woman with endometriosis. And this didrogesterone decreased the risk of breast cancer by 26% in the study. So I think it's very safe. Okay. And there is a very 
question about neuroendocrine imbalance. Of um, traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. I'm fascinated by traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury because these patients are so helpless and they're full of hormone deficiencies that are not being corrected. So basically when you have a brain trauma, the pituitary gland is uh, in shock situation and there's a deficiency uh, of the glands that are stimulated by the pituitary gland is deficient growth hormone that has to be treated. And so these patients recover much better and there is um, a deficiency in um, cortisol. Uh, uh, they have a severe cortisol deficiency. These are the two most important and misdiagnosed or undiagnosed uh, deficiency, but there are studies showing that. Uh, they also can have thyroid deficiency and sex hormone deficiency uh, that needs to be corrected. So you need to do a sort of multiple hormone replacement, but do not forget that growth hormone is fundamental important for recovery. Um, I had several patients with pyrolysis where we reverse the pyrolysis by growth hormone treatment. So it can make a difference. I cannot promise it, but I, I saw the, the change. Now for spinal cord injury, it's more difficult. It's not the brain that is damaged, it's the spinal cord. And uh, there are studies showing that IGF-1 pregnolone improves, but um, you still need to have, eat, need other techniques like... Um, they, they are um, um, stimulating the growth of nerves. There are many uh, studies on, on the going that are probably very promising that may help more, but you need to put down these products or these hormones uh, locally for it to give a result. But the results for trained traumatic injury, you can really wipe it away by a, a very good treatment of it. Then there is a, a Jabber. Is it enough to treat women after 40 with pregnenolone, DHEA, and cortisol, or other hormones are still necessary? Well, age 40, almost all the important hormones have declined. So you have a lower T3, there's a thyroid deficiency, there is a lack of sex hormones. As I discussed, it starts from age 30 on. Uh, so lack of testosterone. So you need to treat all these hormones and certainly also lack of melatonin. So you need to give more hormones to have a better balance. It's already good to treat adrenal deficiency like here with DHEA and cortisone prenone, but uh, you need to treat also the other deficiencies, I think, to be even better. So Isabella is in therapy with enantone and taromazin uh, for uh, breast cancer. And... Uh, um, she want she she wants to know how does she have to manage the hormonal deficit. What what can she do now that she takes this? Enantone uh, is a GN uh, is a suppressor for the gonadotropins. Suppressor oh. and aromazine is aromatase inhibitor. It's like arimidex. Um, okay, so. Um... Basically, what we do is we let the patient take what is prescribed because the patient is in shock, is very afraid. And so we don't want to give you yes. a second opinion that what they do is not, not good. But we add hormones that are completely safe, like thyroid hormones. We add um, the melatonin. And uh, we do give a lot of nutrients um, like carnitine. They have three, three hours of more work or energy in the day by carnitine, four grams a day, for example. And we give also the anti-cancer nutrients like selenium, 100 to 200 micrograms per day, vitamin A, at least 100,000 international units a day. We give some vitamin E. And, um, and we also give coenzyme Q10, 200 to 400 milligrams a day. And usually the patients do well. And then after a certain amount of time, the treatment against cancer that is given, and I don't want to give a judgment here, but it stopped. And, um, and then you can, after a certain number of years, it can be two years, it can be five years, seven years, where the patient degrades, we can also give the female hormones. So I try to take into account that I'm working with other physicians and with a patient who's afraid and needs to get good results in full safety. So I give the good results in full safety. And then eventually I tackle some controversies because the products that are taken, I'm not so sure they have shown um, much efficacy. 
um, um, to decrease the breast cancer risk. So I, I prefer, and also give a lot of good advice for the food that paleolithic type diet, don't burn your foods, uh, decrease sugar and, and all these things. And Chiara says she's in menopause since eight years. She's good. Um, she has a little bit so um, so fat on the abdominal fat. Uh, her gynecologist uh, didn't want to give her uh, HRT. Um, she has a hypo she has hypothyroidism in Hashimoto, uh, but she had never symptoms. She tells, she says, yeah. So it's again a person who needs a wake up call. Uh, she and this wake up call has already started because she asked the question. Um, but um, you can live a life of much higher quality. So why not live a life of much more quality? She could go to your practice and, and get the bioidentical hormones and then she can compare. If she has no complaints, maybe she will say, I feel much better. This is what generally happens. People say, I have no complaints. I just come for control and I'll follow what you give. When they follow what I give, they say, wow, I feel much better. I didn't think life was like that. So I think um, now you are happy because you have a good philosophy but you could be much better when uh, people have hypothyroidism. They not only need to take thyroid hormones, but need to take selenium and vitamin D and myositol to decrease the Hashimoto's disease because it's linked with a lot of other risk factors. And, and so real uh, asymptomatic is a person who probably doesn't listen to her body sufficiently, but, but you're on the good track. You already are open to your mind. So Try to live a life that is wonderful. Why not live a suboptimal life? Okay, that is the same question as before. Then, Kat, is could you discuss using uh, uh, bioidentical HRT with those uh, predisposed genetically to cancer from uh, BRCA uh, genes and uh, CIP and so on? So studies have shown that women are predisposed to breast cancer, but this was more familial predisposition, um, that these uh, persons, uh, when they take BHRT, if they have breast cancer, it's a less dangerous breast cancer because they have taken female hormones before. So I think you can take, but what I would suggest is avoid what is called estrogen predominance, avoid having painful breasts. So I say to all my patients, want to avoid having breast cancer, avoid having breast pain with the treatment. So lower dose of estrogens, enough progesterone, and that makes the thing, it will work out well. Um, studies have shown that women who have breast pain regularly have after five years, two times more risk of breast cancer, after 10 years of breast pain, four um, times more risk of breast cancer. So just avoid having breast pain and take a slightly lower dose of estrogens and you can take the female hormones and I, I almost would bet that you will have less risk of having breast cancer. So Simona, she's in carnivore diet since December 22. She's without uh, menstruation since January. She's good, but uh, she has a little bit uh, so hot flashes uh, and the libido is absent. And uh, what uh, can we advise her to do? Well, um, I don't know her age. Um, I think a carnivorous diet is okay on condition. It's a fresh diet and it's not burned. So don't grill your food. Don't cook it in oil or whatever. Um, studies have shown even that if you avoid processed meat uh, and you just have fresh meat, that actually you have a much um, less risk of cancer. And so I would advise that she would uh, go to a doctor and get her hormones controlled. She goes on bioidentical female hormones and some testosterone and probably some thyroid hormones. And that could be a good start actually. Uh, it depends on the age, so I cannot really uh, comment totally, but I suppose she's near the menopause or something like that to have an absence of um, uh, um, menstruation. Um, but so, so I would again say, why not? Go to a higher level of life and, and, and be fully alive and not half alive. Yes. That is what will happen with the bioidentical hormone treatments. Kat Morris, as a practitioner, what 
do feel is the priority of order when you treat hormonal imbalance, like diet, then liver and gallbladder detox, then, excuse me, I would go to the next question, yeah, okay? But I, I think the, the question is, if I understand, because I see also the question is that um, what the, this practitioner says, um, I, um, I first try to prepare the field before I give the, field, the hormones. And of course, if you have a good diet and you, you detoxify, it will be better. And if you give, give them by dental hormone treatment, it works better. Actually, we do everything together. If the patient comes for the first time, we change the diet. And, uh, and then as soon as we have the lab test, we, we um, give the, the hormones and they do good because they actually have a good diet and they uh, have a better lifestyle, they sleep more, etc. Yes, but I, uh, I mean, it's, it's very important and I write it, it in my book, for example, that uh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not only hormones, of course, and I've seen as many practitioners uh, concentrate in, on adrenals, uh, but, uh, and uh, to give something from adrenals, uh, but I'm very convinced that with a right lifestyle, with a, with a, uh, as you said before, the, the light and sun exposure during the day and to block the blue light at night, you can, so you can preserve your adrenal glands. And that is the advice you have to, to give to patients also to, uh, to oh. ameliorate uh, the, their status. Uh, and uh, of course, nutrition, you are a paleo, Fan. I am a low carb fan. We are very, very uh, close. And I have many carnivore uh, patients uh, as an as a elimination uh, diet, of course. But I, I see that many practitioners stress too much the adrenal glands uh, with, with uh, um, how do you see, integratory with integration with uh, vitamins or coenzymes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that lifestyle is should have the priority. Uh, yeah. That's my point of view. Well, you're, you're, you're pointing on one very important thing is that if you go from a dark room into uh, the light, the sunlight, you have 50% more cortisol production. Yeah. So um, that makes already a big difference. Um, I think sooner or later, all the glands wear out. It's worth to treat the adherence. But you have, of course, stages where you first improve the diet, improve the lifestyle. And when that finally doesn't work because there's aging or there's been an injury or, or stress, then you can go uh, to further hormones. But there's also something we should be careful is that uh, many physicians tend to be afraid of treating adrenal deficiency. And so they give adrenal support that doesn't work much, uh, et cetera. And, and, um, but some people, they have, you know, when you have a cortisol deficiency, your life is not worth living. You suffer all the time. Everything is much more suffering. So it depends on the patient. You, um, of course, we need as physicians to have common sense and first start with the diet and things like that. But some patients are so severely affected, the adrenal glands are destroyed. They need to have cortisol and it makes such a difference. It, they, they are alive again. I saw, an, I have a friend, an older friend, he was almost not moving anymore. And he said, can you do something? Well, look, just take the treatment I take. I just give you a tablet. And, and he said, wow, I never was so good so many years. So see, so just treat the adrenal deficiency if it is necessary. But of course, it, even if you give the adrenal hormones and you don't go in the sunlight, it won't work. So it's always, the lifestyle remains always predominant. A very good start in the day is uh, to look at the sky without sunglasses because so you can stop the production of melatonin and you can so stimulate the production of uh, cortisol in the day and that's that's very important and that's uh, something uh, that we can do every day every one of us so it's so so easy i uh, also think there's also something that goes in your direction is we should express our emotions more inside of ourselves. If you suppress an emotion, you block your endocrine production, your hormone production. So uh, you see many people with a lot of endocrine deficiencies, but they, they are very alive because 
they express their emotions. And I think you Italians are champions. So you're, you're, you're <laughs> uh, for Italy, yeah? for expressing emotions, you're giving the example to the whole world. Okay. Uh, Gerard, according with the yellow book, I think the, the hormone handbook, it's, it's the big one. No, this one. But the, the two hormone handbooks anyway. Yes. Okay, yeah. The, 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 that one, yes. Okay, this one uh, that I suggest you really. Um, good. A postmenopausal woman must have more than 20, 120 picogram milliliter of estradiol. However, it's difficult to me to get this dose for my patients using estradiol. Is this dose the right one? What are you suggesting to get a dose of 120 picogram or more? Again, um, I'm repeating the information I give previously when it's a premenopausal woman, average level in the second phase of cycle, there's more, it should be around 165 picograms per ml, except in Asia where it should be 120. And, um, um, but in the premenopause, uh, the postmenopause, Sometimes it's sufficient to get 70, 80 picograms per ml. Studies show it's sufficient. But again, you should personalize the treatment. Some of your patients need 120 picograms per ml or they don't feel good. And I know some of uh, patients I have, for example, in the United States, they, they need to be full of energy and, and they only do good on, on high enough levels. And some will be enough with 70, 80. Those are the intellectuals. Those are the ones who have a cool life, but very active women probably need more than um, cooler women who are less active. Um, I, I give uh, Gerard, right, because it's not so easy to get to stoses with transdermal, uh, with transdermal uh, application. But I've seen, I have some women uh, who are taking, uh, so Bijuva, who are taking so one milligram estradiol per os. They are really very, so about 30, 25, 30, 35, not much higher. But uh, which dose uh, uh, estradiol would you suggest uh, is adequate uh, to get uh, um, a level of estradiol of uh, 70, 80 picogram milliliter? Ah, well, again, it depends on, but I suppose your question is for postmenopausal woman who has yeah, well, of course. almost no production. Yeah. Uh, you need yeah. actually to get a, a minimum, I think, is uh, of two and a half grams. So that's uh, something like one and a half milligram is the absolute minimum to arrive to 70, 80. And, uh, but all depends also on the skin structure, et cetera. And also at the moment you check the levels, and um, ideal is to check the levels, but that's all hard to do 10 hours after intake, which yeah. is really not done is the next day or just after. Uh, I ask them the next day, and then of course the next day, 24 hours, it's decreased again to a lower side, like 60 or 40. Um, so, but, but I think if you go between one and a half milligrams and 225 milligrams, you arrive at those dose. If you want to go on a, need a higher amount, it will probably be three to four milligrams, but then you arrive at the 120, 130. Yeah. But for the yeah. 70, 80, I think I, the minimum would be uh, something like one, one and, a, and a half to two milligrams, I would say, minimum. Okay. And uh, there is, uh, uh, I did the label of estradiol for cardiovascular protection. Well, there are several studies showing that the limit is either 70 or 74, but one study at Tong showed 84. So try to be above 80, above 85 big grams per ml. But then again, it should be about 10, 12, 14 hours after intake. And 24 hours after is not reliable as a blood test to evaluate that average level that you need as protection. Patricia is asking, uh, uh, but why not the vaginal assumption of testosterone? Well, I have nothing against. I just don't have experience. I, I, I uh, accept to say it. Um, um, I know that um, I think Joshua John the Wright really likes that and works well. Now, I do have a theoretical uh, observation is that um, when you put it under the skin, you accumulate it in the subcutaneous fat and there's a slow release during 24 hours, but there's not much subcutaneous fat in the vagina. So you have direct absorption 
And I think you should do it twice a day vaginally to get the um, adequate levels. But again, this is theoretical, um, but uh, this is one of the reasons as I have good success by giving them transdermal, I haven't tried the vaginal, uh, which might be more difficult to apply, uh, et cetera. And Donatella, uh, she's uh, 61. She has atrial fibrillation. Uh, she takes oitirox as a thyroid hormone. And uh, she asks, uh, can I do something? Um, so now she, uh, there are six months. Uh, she's taking uh, uh, 1.5 milligram uh, ist estriol cream and uh, one capsule of cicatrice canea ah, hyaluronic acid okay uh, she she says yes a little bit better okay yeah a little bit better but it's uh, very very uh, difficult for me to have sexual intercourse uh, she's unsufficiently treated huh? um yeah. So for atrial fibrillation, I have um, a whole lecture of two hours of all you could do. You could take oxytocin, decrease fib atrial fibrillation. But I'll give you one little trick that can make a, an enormous difference and that I do myself because I had the vaccine, got a lot of problems with the vaccine, including atrial fibrillation. But since I do this treatment, I never had any atrial fibrillation anymore. And that is iodine. Iodine, uh, potassium iodide, potassium iodide, 12 and a half milligrams a day. You can take up to 25 milligrams a day. It's a high amount, but it's safe. Iodoral. Yeah, iodoral uh, capsules, but I think iodoral is also pure. Your iodine with iodide potassium. And potassium iodide is the one that, that seems to work. And it's uh, uh, my cardiologist gave it to all his patients. He took all the other antiarrhythmic uh, downs and it works as well. Uh, and why would that work? Well, uh, the best antiarrhythmic uh, substance is cordarone. Cordarone is a molecule linked to I iodine. If you take out the iodine, you put bromide, for example, it doesn't work as an antiarrhythmic. So my cardiologist said, I'll give iodine only, and you don't get side effects because cordarone is full of side effects, can get very yeah. sick with it, and you don't get that with iodine. And I take even 25 milligrams a day. I never had a I get regular measurements. Uh, I have a, a because of the bad reaction I had on the vaccine. I had a I have a little a meeting me, meeting uh, device on me, and since two years I have zero atrial fibrillation. But I did have some after the vaccine. I even had other car, uh, ventricular tachycardia also disappeared. Um, so so that's the treatment that could be helped now yeah. for the woman. I would propose she. There's a better thyroid treatment, but anyway, the thyroid treatment is okay if you don't give excessive doses for atrial fibrillation. And um, uh, I would give estradiol, transdermal estradiol. You could do vaginally estriol and improve the libido with uh, testosterone. And I think she will be already much, much better. Yeah. Um, which hormone do you prefer for insomnia in women going in menopause? Well, I think we answered to this question. I said, yeah. estradiol to not get hot flushes, progesterone to sleep better. However, yeah. most people do better also by taking melatonin, a small dose sublingual, like 0 0.1 milligram sublingual. Uh, and then they take a precursor of melatonin at the same time at bedtime, like um, uh, tryptophan, 500 milligrams. And that converts four hours later in melatonin and then you sleep the night through very well. Wonderful. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Regarding women who have high alpha-dominant testosterone pathways and don't tolerate uh, finasterate, what else do you recommend? Um, I am not so familiar with those high alpha-dominant testosterone pathways. There's, of course, a 5-alpha uh, uh, reductase, etc. So I suppose it's that what is meant. Uh, you don't tolerate finasteride. Um, that's because of its progestative effect. But there are other blockers of androgens. But you know that the best way to balance testosterone and not to masculinize is giving female hormones, estrogens and progesterone. And eventually put some more estrogens on the face if there's a risk there to get uh, hair growth. Uh, so... Um, uh, finasteride is not the panacea. You, 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 every person needs other treatments. 
and you can use androcure, the ciprotron acetate eventually. However, I think this woman doesn't need to take a synthetic derivative or whatever. I think uh, you should balance the estrogen, the progesterone better and put some local estrogen if necessary. And you know also that you stimulate this high alpha dominant testosterone by eating meat. So maybe meat is not the best way because you have more uh, dehydrotestosterone, should probably eat more fish or white meat or something, but I think red meat will stimulate this um, 5 alpha reductase um, testosterone pathway. Paula, um, she asks, uh, she has migraine with aura. Is it possible to take bioidentical uh, hormones? And because uh, um, many docs are saying that if you have migraine, uh, you can't uh, get a uh, bioidentical HRT. No, you just need to balance and to know when the migraine comes up. Um, um, when I started to work in hormone therapy, I started to work with thyroid therapy and nine patients on 10 with migraine had much less migraines with thyroid therapy, but it took four, years, four months uh, to really start improving. Uh, because why do we get headaches with um, um, uh, low thyroid and not enough thyroid hormones? It's because then there's accumulation in the brain that cannot expand. Yeah, of yeah. And so that already helps more. And then you have migraines that are before menstruation. They are usually due to a lack of progesterone. You have migraines during the menstruation. That's due to a lack of estrogen. So correcting the female hormones before the menopause works also well, but you always have to be careful to give start with low doses in order not to aggravate the situation. Because uh, she's 45 and she has uh, vaginal dryness uh, and uh, so the menstrual cycle is so irregular and yeah. uh, uh, she got uh, the pill, but uh, only with uh, um, synthetic progesterone. Uh, because uh, um, the doc uh, told her that it's uh, the only um, possible pill for her because uh, she has uh, migraine. The synthetic progesterone are known to give headaches. So I don't know which she's taking, uh, but um, the natural progesterone, if you give it vaginally, I wouldn't give it orally. Vaginally, I think would work out better, a uh, better way of working out. So I would treat the, this perimenopause by estradiol transdermal like something like one and a half milligrams of transdermal yeah. estradiol and uh, from the fifth to 25th day of the cycle from the 15 25th i would give vaginally a uh, progesterone 100 milligrams and that might go but i think she's also has a thyroid deficiency i suspect that most patients with migraines have some sort of um, decrease in thyroid function Susanna is asking uh, which kind of which type of uh, testosterone the DHA uh, we can get in Italy. DHA we can't get uh, uh, DHA because it's forbidden uh, since two years. We have uh, only one form uh, is uh, ovulo uh, of uh, vaginal application of uh, prasteron. It's uh, six point five uh, milligrams, and uh, testosterone we don't have in Italy any. Uh, any in the pharmacy product, uh, they are too, too high in the dose uh, for, for men. Uh, and uh, you have to compound it uh, to, to get it as uh, in a compound uh, pharmacy. Uh, do you have in Belgium uh, testosterone in the pharmacy? Yes, we have. Uh, we can make it compounded in the pharmacy. Ah, no, compounded. Also DHA compounded, no problem. Ah, you, can, you can get the DHA. Now, so any Italian can get it in other European countries, no, no. you know, what he wants, uh, if it's not available in Italy. No, no, but she asked what in Italy, what's in yes. Italy available. Yeah. And is DHA forbidden? Yeah. June 21, they've um, they forbidden the production of uh, DHA. Last year, they have forbidden the production of pregnenolone. Why oh. nobody nobody knows why? Yeah, and um. so and that's that's a problem because uh, uh, many many women 
are buying DHA on internet and they are buying two, uh, two high levels, two high dosage of uh, DHA without control. And uh, it's catastrophic, really catastrophic. It's, uh... in, in Belgium, they have tried to forbid things and then I usually do a court trial and then it's okay. But you need to do a court trial to rectify yes, the situation. I can imagine. Uh, Shalima, do you have to worry about dermal fatigue uh, with topical application, uh, unlike vaginal? So, because dermal fatigue means fatigue of the skin. So I'm not really 100% understanding. Uh, does she mean that uh, it, when you put a, a cream on the skin, that it does not penetrate sufficiently after a certain time because the, the, the skin gets tired of absorbing. I, I don't, if it, that is what is meant, I, I never have encountered that, that the skin becomes tired and maybe the skin becomes drier because, but I don't encounter this easy because I treat all the hormone deficiencies, thyroid, grotamone, cortisol, whatever, when it's necessary. And then there's an optimal absorption all the time. So it doesn't really decrease with time. But I think if that happens, is because some other hormone deficiencies yeah. has appeared and has not been corrected. Um, I've taken progesterone and growth hormone for 14 years among uh, the whole panel of hormones and still have dropping breasts. Why is this uh, and what can be adjusted? Well, it depends on when this patient started to take hormones. I suppose she's also taking estradiol because the progesterone decreases the breast makes breast droopy if it's too much. So I hope she's taking estradiol. That is what gives more tonicity to the, the breast. Now, if you start it too late because there's the sort of fibrosis in the uh, fibrous tissue in the breast, you cannot uplift it as it was before. So you still need to start on time to take estradiol and progesterone. So not on age 50, but at age 30 or 32, 33 uh, for a breast to remain uh, well adjusted with estradiol and in balance with progesterone. Okay, and Susanna, but they are repetition of other, we, we have signed it, Monica has problems with the translation. Mariana, uh, she has the uh, youth, IUD, um, just like Mirena or Kailina. Uh, is there some core, um, if you have the IUD, is it better to take other hormones or, um, or it's better not to take it as contraception? So the um, IUD, intrauterine device with um, progesterone, uh, Mirena or uh, other types of that, um, blocks the ovaries. So some of the progesterone goes in the body and blocks the ovarian function uh, a lot. So it's not only just the local action of progesterone. And, and so women become depleted estrogen and progesterone. So a woman who has a IUD with progesterone and keeps it, I, I give female hormones, estradiol and progesterone, even if they don't have menstruation, and they do much better. So they receive something like uh, one half milligram of transdermal estradiol. And I make an artificial cycle from the fifth to 25th day of the cycle. And then I give from the 15th, 25th, 100 milligrams progesterone. They don't get menstruation or almost not, uh, but they still, um, they do better. They, they're like rejuvenated. They feel better. Betty asks, what hormones can you take for osteoporosis? There are several hormones to take. What is the cheapest is to take the female hormones. Uh, estradiol and even progesterone improves bone density if it's transdermal, not the oral form. And then uh, there are other treatments like testosterone injections that do good. You also, also, also have synthetic derivatives of testosterone like called nandrolone or decadurabulin that is specially conceived for osteoporosis in women. Uh, that can be given one injection a month. You can also give positonin uh, as a hormone or a parat hormone, two hormones that can improve the bone density and growth hormone too. So there's a really choice where you can uh, quite a lot of uh, improve the spine and the bones with the hormones, but and while you improve other things at the same time. So what do you think about the Dutch test, uh, urine saliva testing? Uh, is using only blood tests to check hormones? 
Yeah, several questions here. The touch test is a 24-hour urine test that is uh, where you measure some spots at certain moments, um, and then you collect that, and that's analyzed, and then the average is taken, and it's sort of 24-hour urine test, but done in another way. It seems to have very good results, very reliable. So I, I don't use it for the moment, uh, but I've read a lot about it. I think it can be a good alternative for 24-hour urine. Um, saliva testing is mainly good for cortisol determination or melatonin, but not so much for the other hormones. It's, uh, for me, unreliable in my experience, and it's better the blood test. Um, I check the blood and 24-hour urine test for the hormones and, and, uh, and on the follow-up only blood test in the initial okay. yeah. 24-hour urine. And it works out well. Uh, of course, it's not only one hormone. I also check the metabolites of the hormone and the binding protein. So it's uh, more complex than just checking the one hormone level to do it. Laura is asking about uh, which kind uh, of blood tests uh, does she have to do with Hashimoto? It's not so pertinent for our team uh, today. Well, uh, there are mainly two tests to do uh, outside of the um, thyroid hormones is to ask the anti-thyroid peroxidase and the anti thyroglobulin antibodies. Sometimes there's an excess activity of the, the thyroid, and then you have also to ask additional tests like uh, antibodies, TSH receptor antibodies that stimulate the TSH receptors. So those are the most important tests, but I also ask, I, I always want to treat my patients. What helps to decrease Hashimoto's disease is selenium and um, vitamin D, and my own is it also for selenium, uh, and vitamin D, we have testing, and, and that is checked uh, truthfully. Iodine seems to have an effect that can, in some cases, especially when there's an excess thyroid, decrease the thyroid function. So I can ask iodine in 24 hour urines. Uh, there's, um, um, and of course, I, I check that the patients don't take milk products. Milk products are linked to more um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um. Okay. Irene wants to know if uh, uterine fibroms, fibroids uh, are the consequence of a hormonal dysfunction, and if yes, no. of which hormone? Yes, mainly due to a lack of progesterone in my experience. So when you lack progesterone, what happens in the uterus, there are contractions, anarchic contractions, and that can give more development in some places of tissue of the uterus. And so um, one of the ways to decrease the fiber development is to have enough progesterone. Okay. Okay. And then uh, which uh, contraindication? Ah, no, this one. Can you share the postpartum and breastfeeding dosing of the hormones? Yeah, so what I give, for example, to my wife or to patients who are um, having had a baby and are breastfeeding, is I start one month after delivery, not before, with um, transdermal estradiol. There's a, we have a sort of um, estrogel, and so it's two pumps. That's about one half milligrams per day in the morning from the first day of the month to the 25th day of the month, because they normally don't have periods at that moment. And I give 100 milligrams of progesterone, and that does not block mm -hmm. the breastfeeding, because progesterone normally can block the breastfeeding, but not with this combination. And they feel so much better. They really uh, don't get this tiredness that women have in the postpartum. And uh, are there also contraindication for uh, HRT? Um, I think there's no real contraindication scientifically. However, uh, when a woman has breast cancer, often it is advisable for the physician to keep his license, don't go in controversies to wait maybe two to five years before treating with female hormones, sometimes even 10 years. And so um, the contraindications is um, the lack of knowledge of the physician or of the community on, on what to do. But I, normally there's almost no case of real contraindication. In some people you have to give lower doses but that's when you have expertise, you know already before even starting uh, that this uh, is like this. And so just 
be careful if you have dots, start on lower doses. How do you manage breast tenderness, breast tension, and swollen breasts, even if the ratio of, of estradiol and progesterone is adjusted correctly? Is there no. any relation between two symptoms and breast cancer to increase breast density? Yes, so um, breast tenderness and too much fluid in the breast is due to uh, slightly higher estradiol and lower progesterone. So you need to change that. You, when you increase progesterone, progesterone stimulates the, the conversion of estradiol to estrone, much less active. So uh, when you decrease the estradiol levels by increasing the progesterone levels, that's exactly what you need to do. So for example, if a woman has a, a week or 10 days before menstruation, uh, breast pain, she takes uh, only progesterone at, in the evening, 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams or 150 milligrams. Uh, from the um, 18th to 26th day of the cycle. And with that is generally adjusted and uh, she will also decrease her breast cancer risk. Because like I said to you, women who have breast pain after five years of regular breast pain, they have two times more risk of breast cancer after 10 years, four times, that risk is decreased when you get progesterone because you take out the breast pain, okay? Many women are afraid of starting a hormone-based therapy for their menopause-related problems because many tumors affecting breast, ovaries, and womb are hormone-related or based. Can you reassure them? Yes. So um, it's simple. If you don't take hormone treatments, you probably die sooner and you have a life that is miserable. So there's no reason not to take it. The thing is that you need to have a good balance with the female hormones. And if uh, I, I actually, I think the only sign that is really important to look is breast pain and breast tension. If that, that is, doesn't appear, it's generally a safe treatment. You're not an estrogen predominant. And, and so that's good. Um, now, do you know that an estrogen dependent breast cancer is very good in the sense that it's a very differentiated cancer. It's not very cancerous. So um, um, it's better to have an estrogen receptor positive cancer and a progesterone positive cancer than having an estrogen negative cancer or progesterone because th those who don't have receptors are already very cancerous, more cancerous, more malignant, and more dangerous. So don't be afraid uh, of, 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 of uh, estrogen and progesterone receptors. Uh, you should take your hormones because you need to have a life worth living and you need to be fully alive. I, I, I would say really um, yeah. um, there's enough reasons. And if you read my books and I have a lot of literature, uh, uh, when we have a whole model on female hormone treatment, uh, estrogen hormone, and you have also um, a, an expert from Austria who, who knows everything about breast cancer and giving female hormones after breast cancer, you have all the literature also, all the, the that that is protective and that explains that it's safe. Just be moderate in your dose of estrogens. That's all. How do you manage spotting during continuous combined estradiol progesterone treatment? The normal continuous combined estradiol progesterone treatment is an oral treatment where the two are given. That uh, uh, it's just that there's a little bit too much estradiol, not enough progesterone. When you take them separate, you take transdermal estradiol and you take progesterone and you have spotting it, and you take them together, it's because there's too much estradiol. So you should lower uh, the dose of estradiol and keep the same dose of progesterone. I think there are so many questions. We won't be able to continue um, much, maybe two or three questions. And then yeah. we is that possible, uh, Christina? Yeah, of course. Uh, Dr. Basaglia, is he, is he working in Italy somewhere? That I don't know, huh? Basaglia. Basaglia, you, you told before that he's Italian doctor oncologist. No, it's, a, it's an Italian who lives in Austria. Ah, I see. Yes, and um, it, I think it's far, um, I'm forgetting a bit of his name now, but. Um, okay. He's uh, um, very enthusiastic and uh, he's reliable. Okay. 
And Andrea asks, melatonin can disturb your entire health system. It's too popular on the market, which can have severe, severe effects on your metabolism. It's also dangerous to give generalized doses out to the population. If you get natural sunlight in your eyes in the morning and protect yourself from artificial light in the evening, it's better to regulate your system. But we, we said it before. I think we explained this, and I think she's uh, is sure uh, that um, but that it disturbs the entire system. This is in the very high doses, not in disease. Very strangely, in disease, there's something. I, I talk often of melatonin and some other hormones, like intelligent hormones, seem okay. to adapt to your situation. And melatonin is one of those. But in a healthy person, don't give high doses, or you have some effects like that. And I wouldn't use the word dangerous because that's not true. Dangerous means it can kill you. Yeah. It can hurt you very severely. And that has never been shown with melatonin. There's no um, a mortal dose. You cannot kill a person with melatonin. There's never a mortal dose that has been shown, which is, is surprising. So, so I, I would be, um, I think the information is very good. Don't overuse, um, but using dangerous words, um, I, I think it's, it's getting away from the truth. Okay, the last question, uh, the half I'm going to answer it. Uh, and uh, for, um, for um, are there contraindications for HRT if you have uh, a um, MT, uh, excuse me, but then so MTHFR uh, heterozygosis or a factor of uh, five laden? And you have also a, a positive uh, family history of uh, breast cancer and uh, other gynecological cancer. I I can say that if you have a factor of laden and a polymorphism, uh, heterozygosis or or or, or a, a homozygosis of methyl tetraido for reductase. Um, 40% of the population have it, okay? And uh, um, as, uh, as uh, told us, uh, Dr. Herr talked before, if you take uh, the estradiol transdermal, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go to the liver and it doesn't exert uh, the effects also on the uh, coagulation system. And so you can do it uh, without problems. Uh, and also if you have a history uh, of, uh, of uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer or, or, or uterine cancer in your family, there isn't a contraindication to have a bioidentical HRT. Do you agree, Terry? Yes, I, I think um, I think you know it even better than I do, so <laughs> I think that's good. Uh, maybe you can just um, end by the, the uh, other slides that I had to show, if it's okay for you. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, where do I share? I think it's here. Yeah, just for um, those who are um, physicians, um, I don't know if you see here. Uh, do you see my slide or not? Yeah, we we'll see. Yeah. A special we'll offer is that? Is yeah. That? Yeah. Oh, so so we had um, so here uh, for those who want to get this um, general um, not for the general public books but for the physician books and for the training we give a 15% off I can tell you that it's really interesting I've been fascinated to make the evidence-based hormone therapy program that just finished now three years I can tell you I think it's high quality and um, um, it really answers to your questions we had a person uh, uh, asking questions of atrial fibrillation well there's there's one hour and a quarter on only on atrial fibrillation now can overcome its hormones, even how you can dose with thyroid hormones and give it. And so, so there's a lot of very good information. You saw these books also of Christina uh, that are, um, I think, uh, breakthrough books for Italy. And um, also I have another webinar, July 13, but it's in French, uh, how to uh, enjoy life again and have energy thanks to the hormone th treatments, uh, the, the keys to overcome the blues, depression, burnout, and things like that. So that's on July 13. If you go on this with your uh, iPhone or mobile phone, uh, you can register. This is also here. Um, and then you have here 
if you want to have more information, you can click on these links. Uh, we're a lot on the social network. And, and, and I think that's it. So basically, uh, Christina, thank you for interviewing me. Thank uh, you, Tiazi. I for your precious great. for your precious uh, informations i hope really that uh, that uh, many can uh, can profit it and uh, to to implement your information uh, in so everyday life thank you You're welcome and thanks for everybody who was there um, i really enjoyed uh, I, I feel the energy through the internet and there were enormous a lot of questions uh, i think it's a record i uh, must really? be 150 or something like that See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.